When did you get in? Um, lunchtime. Lunchtime. Mm-hmm. I'm on book tour at the moment, so I came in from Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, okay. So yeah. you're not jet lagged. I'm not jet lagged, but I did realise that my pants are falling down because I left my belt in Miami, which was the <laughs> date before that. Well, you'll fit right in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you'll fit right in around here. Well, thank you for coming. Um, how many of you know the story? Do you know the broad outlines of the story? Okay. Well, now you're real. Okay. Well, this one will really curl your hair. <laughs> Uh, how much should we tell? Am I going to leave I you? I sort of feel it's out there, so it's I'm, kind of I'm not there? too squeamish about spoilers, okay. really. Okay. Well, this is how one of the, the reviewers, who, rave reviews so far, uh, described it. A mystery story, a tabloid story, a crime story. In some ways, it's actually a little bit self-help, a little bit sure. uh, yeah. a, 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 a sort of journey, a quest, mm-hmm. all rolled into one. So the brief outline, shall I or shall you? Uh, Go for it. The brief outline, your remarkable mother, born in South Africa, her mother died when she was two, she made her way to England, uh, and then she sadly died sooner than I think anyone would have liked, Mm -hmm. um, including most especially you, but certainly her, and then you made your way back to South Africa where you unpeel the layers of this remarkable story that she had only hinted at. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you with that, if you don't mind, just if you just read a couple of passages from the opening of the book. Sure. Okay, so this is from, this is the opening few paragraphs of chapter one, um, after the prologue. So the chapter is called, If You Think That's Aggressive, Then You Really Haven't Lived. My mother first tried to tell me about her life when I was about 10 years old. I was sitting at the table doing homework or a drawing. She was standing at the grill cooking sausages. Every now and then, the fat from the meat would catch and a flame leap out. She had been threatening some kind of revelation for years. One day I will tell you the story of my life, she said, and you will be amazed. I had looked at her in amazement. The story of her life was she was born, she had me, ten years passed, end of story. Tell me now, I'd said, I'll tell you when you're older. A second later, I'd considered saying, am I old enough now? but the joke hadn't seemed worth it. Anything constituting a life story would deviate from the norm in ways that could only embarrass me. And indeed, it was and is amazing. And we'll get to that. But the first thing I wanted to ask is, when did you realize that there was something truly there? And not just in the way that you know all kids think that their parents are amazing until they think they're not and are... are <laughs> it's it's weird because it, it's like I was able to hold two contradictory thoughts in my mind at once. So I knew that something I, I knew that there was something wrong with the picture. But while my mother was alive, I wasn't sufficiently interested to hold it up close in in the way that children aren't. You, 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 you're, not, you're not fascinated by your parents' background um, until you have to be. And and also the thing is, my mum was quite theatrical, so you know she was all jazz hands all of the time. So when she would drop these really heavy weather hints about having been involved in some, you know, extraordinarily dramatic event long before I was born, a part of me just thought, you know, well, how dramatic was it? And you go to the shops and have some sort of major encounter with, you know, and she was constantly at war with our next door neighbors. I mean, there was always some drama going on. So I, I sort of, I sort of didn't, it's not that I thought she was lying, but I, I imagined that there was some sort of theatrical exaggeration going on. And so a, a really strange part of me was kind of relieved when I found out that there was an actual concrete event behind all of this and that I hadn't been misinterpreting signals for the entirety of my life and also that my mum wasn't mental, you know, <laughs> that, um, that, that all of this was true. There had been clues along the way and I want to get to that, but I did want to fast forward and again I have to say I'm so sorry for your loss. Oh, I mean, thank the fact you. is losing a parent just sort of sets your world on its axis. And, uh, but then in the midst of losing her and she had cancer mm-hmm. and it was, seemed painful, it seemed painful and hard. Um, how did you get the idea that you would then go to South Africa and try to unpack that story? It was, it happened instantaneously. It was such a strange thing. It was, um, and I don't know if anyone who's lost a parent has had this experience, but it felt to me like the day after she died, my relationship with her history changed entirely. So right up until the 11th hour, I had still maintained absolutely no interest in what had happened to her before I was born. And 
and the second she was gone it was all I could think about and it, and it felt like th that history was now mine and if I didn't take it on it would just disappear with her into oblivion and and I would lose more of her than I wanted to so I thought the only sane thing to do was to go was to go to South Africa and try and find out all the stuff that she hadn't been telling me. And did your dad know? There is a dad. I mean, yeah, he my dad a, he seems like a good dad. Oh, my dad's a thoroughly excellent person. He's um, very mild, very English. Um, you know, he's he's the antidote to everything that she knew up to the age of sort of 25, 27. Um, and, and the way I've come to think about it, my dad's role in my mom's life is that like my mom was like a first world war veteran who'd been in the trenches and came back like they did and decided not to tell her spouse like of the horrors that she'd seen and my dad sort of honored that and and didn't press her so he he knew as much as i did which was that there'd been really? yeah he knew that there'd been a big court case that her dad had been a you know violent alcoholic and a pedophile um and that's all he knew like the bare bones outline and she blurted it out at one point. And yeah. you, and that scene is remarkable to me. You kind of burst into tears and then you don't talk about it, which I find very English. I just have to totally. say, sorry, I think I get to say this. Is that racist that I said that? Is that wrong yeah. of me to say that? I was, like, I was like, that's really very English. I know, which is- That's my image of what? Totally, total repression. She burst out. My, you know, my father was an alcoholic and a pedophile and you burst into tears. So all of you stopped talking about it. <laughs> For 15 years. Well, hang on, but I was 10. Um, well, so yeah. I didn't have like that was the only response I could organize. Yeah, but we would have called Oprah. So I right, mean, right, I mean, right. that's the way. Or, yeah, or got like a family therapist to come in exactly immediately. Yeah, I know my poor mum. I, I, I feel terrible for her now thinking back because it was the it was the only time um, up until the last summer of her life where she tried to say something to me. But I was just I was far too young, and and she obviously wasn't ready to talk about it because the voice that she used when she started that sentence was. I, in the book, I say it was like a, a medium channeling an angry spirit. It wasn't her voice. I mean, it was, she was so constrained. Um, and I was completely alarmed. And yeah, I shut her down instantly by bursting into tears. Um, and yeah, we didn't talk about it again, except that we did. I mean, in a million different ways, um, it would come out in things that, that later I revisited in my mind and realized were absolutely related to what she hadn't been telling me, for example. I mean, tiny things, but like... If we were watching TV together and we were watching a cop show, you know, child abuse storylines are really frequent on those kind of CSI type shows. And my mum would completely overreact to any kind of uh, child abuse storyline. Like, like, what do you mean? Well, so she would just be, she would be like conducting a dialogue with the screen, well, a monologue at the screen. Um, so she would be, you know, saying they should hang him, you know, they should cut his bollocks off, <laughs> whatever. You know, she got, she would get really exercised mm. and, and it was, and it was obviously not, a, you know, regular reaction. Mm. Can I get you to read another section that we talked sure. about earlier? You made, in, in a way it's fascinating because this is such a heavy thing and you made preparations, but not the ones that one might think. You know, you didn't spend months poring over maps and making reservations mm. and writing letters, which is this image that I think a lot of us have about how, what you do if you'd go on this kind of journey. You kind of got on the internet, made some reservations, but then you went and did one other thing. I just want to re get you to read that piece. Sure. Um, okay. My mother told me she had been to a therapist once when she first arrived in London. It hadn't worked out and she didn't try again, which she probably should have. That winter, I go to see one too. I tell her I'm a journalist gearing up to fly to South Africa to meet my mother's family for the first time and to bring up potentially painful subjects that they may or may not have talked about before. I'm interested in her advice, not as a therapist to patient, but as professional to professional. I don't want to give anyone a breakdown. She opens her mouth to respond, but before she can get a word out and to our great mutual surprise, I burst into tears, angrily retract them, drag my arm across my face and through great hacking sobs suck a large plug of snot back up my nose. She nudges a box of tissues in my direction. Ah, oh, I can't believe I did that, I say. She looks at me kindly. After I recover, she says it's possible no one will want to talk to me. She suggests I observe boundaries and take my cues from the people I'm speaking to. At the end of the session, she recommends I come back next week. I tell her I'll be in touch. I didn't go back. <laughs> <laughs> and then you do fly off and your journey takes you to the reading room and you pull down this ledger and you find what? 
um, a transcript of the High Court trial, which my mother had managed to uh, bring against her father, my grandfather, which was no small feat in 1950s South Africa when you could basically do what you liked behind closed doors and the authorities had absolutely no interest in prosecuting you for it. So, Especially if you were white. Right. Oh, exactly. Right. I mean, exactly. Uh, exactly. You could do no wrong. So, and, and also, uh, yeah, if, if you were a guy. Um, so, so my mum had, after years, I think, of trying to get the police to show an interest in what was going on in their family, finally managed to have her father arrested. He was found guilty at grand jury level. The case was promoted up the chain to um, the High Court in Johannesburg. Um, and there was a, a big trial and the transcript was still in the archive. Do you mind saying exactly what was happening? Oh, sure. Do well, you all mind hearing? For those of you who are going to read the book, I don't want to... Um, it's a shock. It is and it isn't. It is well, and it isn't. So. I, I say, I mean, it's, it's okay. kind of front loaded. It's in the, it's right up the, okay. it's right up the front. So it's fine. So yeah, he was a, he was a child molester. So he was abusing, he was, he was beating up everybody in his family, but he was abusing, he was sexually abusing his daughters. Um, the youngest, when my mother had him arrested, finally, um, the youngest was six. Uh, the youngest daughter was six. Um, at, but the plaintiff in the trial was my mum's favorite sister, which I'm sure was a motivating factor. Uh, she was 12. So she was the star witness, uh, my aunt. And the, and the, most shocking thing about this is that as the law permitted at the time, um, this guy, my grandfather, was allowed to defend himself and cross-examine his own children and his wife in open court uh, in front of the press benches, in front of, um, you know, a packed courtroom and destroy them one by one. And so where does the gun come in? <laughs> so um, as if there isn't enough going on in this story, um, <laughs> that when I was growing up, there was always a gun in the house that my mum would talk about sort of wistfully. Um, as this thing that she wanted to leave to me as a kind of symbolic, I think like my mum thought it was exactly the sort of thing that a woman should leave to her only daughter, a <laughs> firearm. And, um, and it had this whole mythology attached to it. She had smuggled it into the country, wrapped in a pair of knickers at the bottom of her trunk, and she'd managed to get it through customs undetected, which she thought of as like her first triumph against the English in the new country. Um, and she'd had it hidden in our house all the time that I was growing up. And the reason she had it, she said, was that everybody had one in Johannesburg when she was growing up. That's all she would say about it, and which I took, I took to be the truth. Um, but that actually wasn't why she'd had it. I mean, she, she had it because she had tried to shoot him, uh, her dad, before getting him arrested. But she wasn't very good at it, so, so that hadn't succeeded. When you found this out, what happened to your world? I mean, did the room spin? What, what happened? Well, it was fairly, it was hair raising being in that archive and, and reading testimony, like my mother's testimony um, was extraordinary. I mean, it was a very, it was, a, it was, yeah, I did have kind of vertigo while I was doing that. But at the same time, I mean, I, ha I had been a journalist for 10 years by then. I was used to detaching from a situation and just you know sucking the information out of it and processing it later um and it is surprising to me that you can do that with your own family but actually it turns out you can um and it's not as though I was interviewing my mum in front of me she and I could never have had this conversation but you know being in an archive reading reading the information cold on the page was doable and then interviewing all of these people her siblings who I had never met um was like an extension of what I do for a job. I, I didn't know them, but they just happened to look a bit like my mum. So, it, it, yeah, it was hair raising, but it wasn't totally destroying. Your mother, I feel I can say this, was a true heroine. She could have left long before, and she didn't. Mm. Um, she continued to take the abuse. I mean, she had the means to leave. She was a very bright student. She had a job. Mm. She had... She could have moved out, and she didn't. Yeah. And why didn't she? Because mm. she loved her siblings. I mean, she was the oldest of, of eight children, um, the oldest by seven years, and her stepmother didn't cope, wasn't, wasn't coping well. So my mum raised half of them, and she, they were like her children. And I think you don't leave your children when they're being attacked. So she, she stayed put. And then she finally did leave. Right, did well... Did you ever address the, the mystery of like, when she finally did leave, what caused her to leave? I mean, for years she told people politics. She right. couldn't abide the politics of the country. 
right? Well, but, actually, she she couldn't. She hated it, but that wasn't the, that wasn't why she left. Right. Yeah, I think well, she, it took her it took her eighteen months to get her stuff together. But what motivated emigration ultimately was that the trial to so the trial failed. He was found not guilty um, because his second wife, my mother's stepmom, lost her nerve at the at the last minute and lied for him. So. Um, so I think my mum felt that she, all of this had been for nothing, that she'd dragged her siblings through a horrific public ordeal, that they had been publicly humiliated, that this monster had, you know, won. And this is an indication of what a psychopath this man was, that after the verdict came through, he walked across to my mother, who was sitting with the barrister, and sort of leered at her across the bench and said, um, aren't you proud of me? I mean, you know, totally psychopathic. Um, so I think she felt that she'd done absolutely everything she could at that point. She was 25 and she probably thought if she was going to have a life that had any value to it, she needed to get away from this place and, and them. And actually, the, the, the real tipping point is that after the trial, um, her stepmother took him back. So she was done. <laughs> you know, it's remarkable. This also personal story, this incredibly intimate, horrible, disturbing story, also takes place against the intimate, disturbing politics of South Africa. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I, mean, I think most of the people here are all old enough to understand that this was a, you know, utterly segregated society in which, you know, we, we talk about here, you know, white is right if you're white, you know, mm. you're right if you're brown, stick around, if you're black, step back. I mean, that's right. a saying we have in this country, but, you know, every facet of life, the, just, and, and for black who are in the majority there, right. And so just if you would just reflect, if you would, a little bit on how you think the politics of the country maybe fed into this. I think it, I think it has to have done. I don't think it's coincidental that, that, um, that these kinds of domestic abuse cases within white South African families are off the charts. I mean, it's... There's, Charlize Theron's mother right. shot her... Shot her dad, right? Yeah, I mean, shot her know, dad. I mean, it's. I mean, it's 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 relatively common. Mm -hmm. um, it's partly because alcoholism is a really big problem out there. But I, I think it is has something to do with the, with the background of the country, which is that I thought about this. My my grandfather's family emigrated um, from Holland in, at the turn of the twentieth century, and they they lived in a mining compound in the north of Johannesburg. They had absolutely nothing. Um, they were religious fanatics. Um, they came from a very impoverished background in Holland, from what I understand, and they arrive in this country and they are part of a master race suddenly. Um, and I just think that if you, in that era, if you, if you raised a white child to believe that no matter what he did, he was intrinsically more value, valuable than an entire race of people, it, I mean, it, the, he had a free pass. He, he was an emperor, even though he was a scumbag. I mean, so that kind of pathology, I think, is almost designed to create psychopaths. It's interesting, though, that, as you mentioned, the domestic abuse, and the, the word just seems too small to describe right. what we're talking about. I mean, yeah. it just really seems it's too small. To right. It's kind of horrendous. It's like being a, a, a tortured in your own house right. daily, and you, you know, by someone who's supposed to love you. And, and for years, you, right. And for years and years and years. But it's just interesting to think about why it is and it's well known that domestic violence is so much a part of white South African right. life. And to, and now, even now, you know, the rape culture is something people right. openly talk about rape culture in South Africa it's be, across all groups. And I'm just interested if you had any insights into how it is that that, I, that kind of racial oppression dovetailed so with this kind of sense of impunity in the home of... Um, whether I mean whether it also it must also have something to do with the fact that the state was brutalizing people left right and center I mean everybody was marinating in this in this culture of completely normalized violence so it's not as though the government was setting an example there were no moral standards or the moral standards were completely inverted so um, so I'm sure that had something to do with it I mean it, and it is a very misogynistic culture there um, in white society, all of those roots that draw down into, you know, Lutheran and, and, and extremist Calvinist um, theology, uh, where, you know, man is king um, over his wife and children. I think a lot of people took that literally when the country was being, you know, the culture of the country was being created. And also, I think with, you know, this is, this was, this is a particular demographic, which is, you know, you had to try in that era, you had to try quite hard to be poor and white in South Africa, and they succeeded spectacularly. In fact, it was, you know, it was their greatest achievement. Um, and I think that as as a guy as a white man not succeeding in south africa if you you know when when you have been brought up to believe that you are 
you have these delusions of grandeur because you are better than the majority of the country and 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 yet you are still a failure i think i think that probably triggers a lot of you know anger and thwart and th and thwarted um ambition or whatever it was that 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 made him so violent there are lessons for other scenarios that we won't go into right now i don't know maybe you all will um i think wouldn't you all love to participate now have you heard enough that you'd like to Get, jump into the conversation. Just one more question, and I'll, I'll ask you this, and then I'll save some time at the end for one more closing thought, is why did you want to write this book? I mean, you are a journalist, so that is th your trade. Sure. But, but I don't know that everyone, having discovered that her grandfather was not just a, 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 an alcoholic and a violent pedophile, but also a murderer. We didn't get to that part, oh, but yeah. we'll save that for, we'll save that for <laughs> you know, our next chat. A murderer um, might not necessarily want boat. to, to uh, <laughs> well, share that with the world. The thing is, it, it is a great story. It's a, it's, a, it's a great story, and I am a journalist. And, and it's not just a great story because it has tons of lurid details. It's, it's, it's a great story because the way I came to think of it was that if you had to come up with a, a cruel psychological experiment this, to, to see what the long-term effects of trauma on children are, this is it. There were eight children, eight different personality types, all of whom were exposed to exactly the same kind of extreme pressure in their formative years. And then nobody talked about it. And I revisited them 50 years later. And basically every kind of post-traumatic stress disorder was represented in those siblings. So there was a lot of repeat patterns of violence, lots of alcohol and drug abuse. There were, there were the ones who had, you know, the, who'd sought therapeutic help, the ones who had never said a word to anyone ever. Um, it, it's a fascinating few successful marriages your mother no, had one of the yeah, few successful the only one. marriages the yeah, only one the yeah. only one and some of you know um so it it was a it's a fascinating case study in the long range effects of 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 um you know childhood trauma the other the other reason that i wanted to write it is that i f i hope that it it militates against the misery memoir market i mean it, it, there's also because it you, it has a lot of the same material that that i think has been used uh in that genre, and and I hope it's not a miserable book. I, I mean, it's not sentimental. I hope that I hope there's a lot of joy in it. I hope that it's funny. The people in it don't think of, think of themselves as victims. Um, and as an indication of how hostile I am to some books in that genre, the working title for this book was "Boo Fucking Who," um, but <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't allowed to. Have Good it. luck getting that on the radio. <laughs> Who would like to, hello, I think I saw a hand here first, if I may, and then we'll come over here next, is that okay? Mm -hmm. You alluded to it saying that the, um, the siblings then are all exhibiting traits. Mm -hmm. Did you go back further than your grandfather? Did you find that he came from that same kind of environment? Sure. I, well, I, yeah, I had an unpublished memoir that was from his, um, what would it be, his first cousin who grew up next door to him on this mine compound and actually who became an academic and uh, was a historian in, in the U.S. Um, and no, he wasn't, he wasn't brutalized as a child. I mean, they were quite poor. Um, his dad was a, uh, worked in the gold mines also but he wasn't, it was quite a loving background from, from what I understand. And, and his sibling and his cousin went on to be perfectly normal adults. So there's, there's, no, there's no real explanation for what that was. Yeah. When you were talking about the racial dynamics, I kept thinking, where's a women's movement when you need one? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd like you to expand on the gender dynamics in the, both the era in which your grandfather was active. active. <laughs> I was starting to say raising a family, and that seemed inappropriate. So, um, but also in terms of contemporary um, gender issues in South African society, has, ha, is there a feminist movement um, in that society? You know, I don't even know. I, 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 I was there for six months, sort of five years ago, and, and I haven't kept as up with it as I should have done. I mean, the trade, the trade union movement has tra traditionally been quite strong there, um, and I think there are women's chapters within it, which are quite vibrant, but it is still a very 
um, macho society. I mean, if you've ever met any South African men, maybe there are some here. They're probably lovely. Um, but um, but it, um, it, it's, it still feels, when you go there, like a very old-fashioned, um, male-dominated uh, society. And, uh, you know, it, that, that, that plays out at, at, at home. Um, this, the, the second, the, the woman who my grandfather married um, after my grandmother had died was only 17. So, you know, irrespective of the broader political culture, she was uh, practically a child herself, so she had no, no hope of, st of standing up to him. You met her. No, she, di she, she, she died. She died before you. Yeah. But you'd corresponded with her? Had you spoken to her? I no, to have I had nothing on her nothing at all. Her. No. Mm -hmm. She was, she was, must have gotten confused with some of the siblings. I mean, because there were so many. There's so many of them. There's so right. many of them, you know. But weirdly, that, that was the biggest taboo of the, um, of the journey was that I felt I could talk to them about their terrible dad, but, but it was very hard to talk about the mum who hadn't, you know. Who didn't stand up for who them. Who didn't stand up for them. Who did yeah. not protect them. Yeah, that was tough. So, yes. yes. Hello. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. I can't wait to read it. Um, I have kind of a process question, I guess. At what point did you know that you were writing a book? Um, you know, well, before you left for, for South Africa, did you, were, did you go with the intention that, you know, you were going to be interviewing people for a book, or did you come back and say, well, <laughs> um, this is what I have? Well, I told myself from the outset that, that I was going to do a book, or that I would take notes, because that felt like a necessary psychological <laughs> strategy <laughs> um, to stop myself from being too involved in what I was hearing. So I was taking notes throughout. Um, it wasn't until quite late in the process that I thought I would be able to do it because there were um, th there were lots of pitfalls with this kind of book, and I actually I didn't I didn't want to revisit the material. So when I I took all those notes and I didn't look at I didn't look at them for like two two or three years afterwards. I emigrated to America in the meantime, um, and as I was writing, right up until the you know the final stage of the first draft i still i still wasn't sure that i would that i would actually publish it so i, I like i didn't sell it in advance because i didn't want to be on the hook uh you know and have to hand back money <laughs> to a publisher when i felt i couldn't do it so uh, so i always had the intention to do it but i was willing to allow myself not to do it if it didn't work out if that makes sense sure Sure. Um, th so the question was, could I talk about the title and the process of choosing it? Actually, I didn't come up with it. Because um, uh, it's not quite accurate. I know. Well, it's figurative, <clears throat> <laughs> is what I was saying. Um, uh, my, uh, Nora Ephron came up with it. Um, she was uh, very good at titles. And she was a friend of mine, and we were having lunch. And um, she came up with it. And it was great <laughs> and jaunty. Um, uh, she wanted the subtitle to be a love story, which is very Nora. <laughs> um, but um, I thought that made it sound too much like a novel. So, uh, yes, it's not... She, uh, yes, it, I mean, if we were being strictly accurate, accurate, it would be called... She very much wanted to leave me the gun, but then she <laughs> lost her nerve because gun, gun licensing became a really big issue, so she handed it in during Amnesty in the 90s. <laughs> sorry I'm about sorry, that. it's another loss. I'm sorry, you know, because... <laughs> You know, losing. what the actual weapon? No, losing oh. Nora. Oh God, sorry. <laughs> I know, I know, horrific. I mean, you know, because she she shocking. was a person who'd kind of take over like a mom. You mm, know, totally. okay, this is what you're gonna do, and right. you know, and yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also, she was very much one for, um, you know, get you know, get on with it. She she wasn't a big one for complaining. And also, use your material. Yeah, you use know? your material. <laughs> yeah. Don't waste anything, right? Right. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's sad. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Don't be shy. She's told you about her pedophile grandfather. Exactly. <laughs> what subject can we not We're discuss now? now? So has the book been published in South Africa? And if so, what is the response, both of the public and of your, the family? Right. Well, I'm about to find, find out. I'm, I'm going on book tour there uh, the week after next. So we'll see. Um, I've had, a, I mean, it's been out there for... I think in limited release for a week or so, just in the airports. Um, uh, the main thing is that I, I realize how small uh, white South Africa is because I've had letters from, everyone who's read it so far seems to know somebody in the book. Um, I had a very sweet letter from someone who said she had been one of my uncle's therapists. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I think it will be a very personal um, 
response from South Africans when I'm out there. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether because I'm English, it, there will be some resistance to what will be perceived to be criticisms of the country. I, I, I don't know. Um, I'll find out. I wish I had it. Actually, I don't wish I had it. I don't mind not having it. But funnily enough, my dad the other day found the um, the original license uh, just in a box. Um, we thought we'd lost it, um, which she got in Johannesburg in 19, whatever it was, 56. Uh, so I now know, when I, was, when I had a first draft and I was starting to show it to my friends, all my male friends who I showed it to said, like, you can't publish this book and not say what kind of gun it is. It... <laughs> It would be like writing about a car and not saying what kind of car it was. And I was like, what, why would that be problematic? <laughs> anyway, and none of my female friends cared. But, um, but it was a .22 uh, revolver. Uh, so I have the paperwork, which, you know, is the next best thing. Well, we, we would say twenty two caliber, wouldn't we? Would you? I, I'm we would so say a twenty two caliber. Okay. It was a revolver. Like, yes. And pearl handled. Pearl handled. Quite, you know. Silver, silver barrel. Yeah. yeah. A girl gun. It was a girl gun. A it girl was a total gun. lady gun. I was um I was really um disappointed when she showed it to me because I was imagining it would be like a you know chunky noirish LA you know story kind of gun, but it wasn't. Anybody? Well, I have always more questions. Which is uh, first of all, thank you for making this easy. It's always so daunting interviewing another journalist because you feel like your questions are going to be judged. Well, that wasn't a very good question, <laughs> you know that kind of thing. So thank you for being My nice pleasure. about it. So, the, how, what is your, how does your dad feel about the book? Um, he must be so sad in he, some ways. He, yeah. Um, he's been really supportive. So he always said, if you want to do it, then do it. And do you want me to come with you when you go? And, um, but it's been deeply weird for him. I mean, it, not even because of all the, all the dramatic material, but just to read an account of your home life when you haven't written it. You know, he's probably just as disturbed by what, you know, my account of conversations which he would have remembered differently. So the whole thing for him has been existentially uh, troublesome. But my dad is a lovely person, so he's he's been completely solidly supportive. But yeah, and sad too. I mean, we've he and I have had lots of lovely conversations um, about my mum and reminiscing about her. And 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 the funny thing is, is that it, you know, I worried when I started to write it that it would somehow poison my memory of her that I would pollute all these great because she was a great mum you know we we would you know we were just laughing the whole time and I thought if I dig up all this stuff that she moved heaven and earth to keep me away from that I would undo everything that she had done and actually that hasn't happened at all I still in my mind's eye she is still exactly as she always was it had that that those images of her like peeling potatoes in the kitchen looking up to see me as I come through the door haven't been displaced with all this crazy stuff it, this wherever it is is in a in a different um, department in my mind. So, why would you think it would pollute your image of her? For me, I feel so the opposite. I mean, obviously she's not my mother, and and, and I don't know her, but she. F I just feel her sacrifice is so profound. I mean, it's almost Christ-like to me. Right. Forgive me. I don't know if that's any means anything. For me, it's almost Christ-like. I mean, she literally sacrificed herself. And I just find that so profound. And she also, in some ways, there's something else I wanted to ask you about, the way you, you describe it as sort of cauterizing that part of her life mm. to protect you. Right. I'm fascinated by that. Amazing. So I'm just curious why you think that would have sort of, you just didn't know? Or? No, because, because I think if, if you have loved someone, the most painful thing is to imagine them in, in a position of being hurt. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that can gnaw away at you. And I, and, and I had never had to deal with that. I had always just known her as a completely happy you know, in control, joyful person. And, and, and there are images which come to mind when you read this book, which are not images you want to have. And actually, as it turns out, I think mm -hmm. something happens in your brain, which is a kind of airbag, which inflates. So even when I've tried in my most masochistic moments to sit down and be like, right, <clears throat> you know, in the interest of dealing with these things, as we are supposed to do, you're going to try and imagine what all of this was. You, you, it, it's not possible. It just doesn't work. You just, you, your brain just shuts down. So... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, of course, I think of her as a terrific heroine and mm -hmm. all of this has only increased my mm -hmm. admiration and love for her. But it hasn't stopped her basically just being the mum that I remembered. Do you ever feel, you know, those of... Uh, you cannot help but have followed that story in Cleveland, the ter terrible story. This is actually what came to mind when I read the, the book about these women were hostages in their own house. These girls were hostages in their own house, even though and the Cleveland story came to mind. And I remember the interview with the daughter of the accused, I'm sorry, I know everybody's a lawyer, the accused, and she said, we don't have monster in our blood. 
and you wonder did you ever fear when you heard the whole story that totally. did you ever fear for yourself Co- totally what well, yeah like i'm 50 percent maniac or, or a court 25 percent right. maniac yeah absolutely i did use i did think that and i was like you know so you know if and when i have a kid what are the chances that this rogue gene is going to resurface but then i would just remember my mum, and i thought well you know she had she had more of that <laughs> than i did because we're now diluted by an extra generation and she was the most amazing person that i ever met so what are you going to do and also like as we know it doesn't work like that you yeah. can you can you know the greatest people on earth can have the worst children but you know but you know but isn't it isn't it true that some of the so. brothers that were afraid to have children weren't they? one of them, one said, of them he was. said he yeah, was yeah her he, brother steve who yeah. who she had had been one of hers that she called you know my baby she would say he was steve was my baby he said that he had watched how his brothers had treated some of their families um and he didn't marry because he wasn't sure that he couldn't pass on the the um the, the kind of cycle of brutalization they i mean there was there was no more pedophilia but you know it was they they were quite they were rough they were rough people some of her brothers were were not gentle people mm-hmm. um yeah so he didn't marry for that reason although when i put this to one of his sisters she rolled her eyes and said no one would have him more like <laughs> <laughs> tough crowd does anyone else have a question before we let you go don't don't leave this opportunity because of course you know you're you're going to leave and go abroad and be super famous and like nobody, <laughs> even more famous. Um, other than obviously hope for good literary reviews and so on, is there anything that you hope will come out of this book uh, or any reaction to it that you fear? Or um, is it just, it's out there, it's your book, it's, it's people take it for what it is? No, that's a very good question. I am. Um, I have had fears, and it took me, and that's why it took a long time to, to put together. Because, you know, we, you know, we are rational people, and we lead lives that we control totally. But there is still some atavistic part of you with this, with this kind of story, which is like, this will bring me down because it's so gross. You know, you know what I mean. That, that and and this is what keeps people from reporting. Um, abuse uh, abuse always because y- the shame is so strong and you know I'm a generation removed and I felt it I felt the echo of that and I thought oh I don't know if I can do this it's you know it's not very respectable what if people's opinion of me you know takes a massive nosedive because of all this dirty laundry that I'm that I'm airing and the counter to that was that I thought no one in this book has done anything wrong um, you know, among among my my mom and her siblings, and in fact, they are the most extraordinarily courageous people who who lived an extraordinary life, and who I hoped you know deserved to have to to be praised and for that story to be shared. So, yeah, those were the two counterweights. Sir, the gentleman had a question here, and this I think will be the last. Yes. Oh right. Well, <laughs> um, this is why I couldn't write it as a novel because it would just be too contrived. Um, so my mum got the boat from Cape Town in 1960. It was a two-week voyage. Uh, when she docked in Southampton, a steward came up to her and said, "There's a telegram waiting for you in the Union Castle office." She went, picked it up. It was a telegram from her stepmother saying that while she'd been at sea, her father had uh, dropped dead of a brain hemorrhage. And he'd been buried while she was on the ship, and that was the end of that. Mm-hmm. So she started her new life in London with, with him gone. I expect you to say something British, like "All oh. right then." Or something. <laughs> no, exactly. well, yeah. Oh well, she, was she free though? I think I think, and you know, none of the siblings really have much of a relationship with each other. I mean, they're they're, they're all connected in very complicated, in some ways deeply loving ways, but. They fi- I think they find it quite hard to be in a room together. And I think it's because he had gone, but obviously he hadn't gone. That, that, that shadow is a very long shadow that gets cast by a father like that. And I think much as they, she loved her siblings, she found it almost impossibly painful to be in a room with them and, and to be reminded of who she was before she decided to be this other person. That's what the last question I had for you, which is, and the other thing I have to say is that the beauty of the writing and the joy in the writing is such a stark contrast to the pain that you describe that I almost found it disorienting, which is why I think those of you, when you read it, you will find it very hard to put down because you'll be kind of searching for the, it's almost like kind of, you know, the way, you know, they still have ether. We're in a hospital, so I was thinking about ether. They still have ether. You feel sort of vaguely disoriented, but you're still conscious that kind of moment. You feel vaguely disoriented because like the beauty of the words are almost intoxicating. 
you know, it's like the, the gardenias or the magnolias are blooming now. And yet what you're describing is so horrendous, you just really don't want to think about it. But that was my question, my final question was, how did she do it? You ask a very profound question um, in the book of how do you cauterize that part of your life and choose to be someone else? And she did this without changing her name. I mean, she didn't like, you describe it as almost like going into witness protection, mm -hmm. but she did maintain relationships with people right. from a distance. Mm -hmm. I mean, she didn't change her name. She didn't hide from them. She didn't refuse to be in connection. How do you think she did that and chose to be happy and to create you and to love you and to... It's such an unanswerable... How do people do these things? I have... I, I, I kind of have no idea i mean she actually she she made a slight change to her name who knows if it was um symbolically important or not she was called pauline and they had always called her pauline and from her first day in in britain she called herself paula and she always said to me it was because she thought pauline was soppy a soppy name but i'm sure it had a, a sort of you know uh, symbolic weight to it but but i don't think it was instantaneous i think it took her so she arrived in in britain in 1960 she didn't have me until 1975 and she didn't marry my dad until 72, I think. So she worked on she worked on this for 10 years. She had an amazing group of friends in London who nurtured her, a, a, like the most ideal uh, circle of friends for a woman coming out of that background, which was gay men, who just like nourished her, who were, who were brilliant, brilliantly supportive of her, and who I went to interview at the end of the book to try and find out what she had looked like before she became this kind of finished product. And they said, one of them, very sen very sensitive, um, a friend of hers called Edward said um, she wasn't depressed she was compressed and he said the image that came to mind when he first met her was of someone who'd been in a kind of crusher like in the cartoons you know someone who'd, who was this who was this big and had all the air crushed out of them and he said that slowly over the course of, of that decade they watched her f you know fill out again and become a, a, a sort of substantial person um, and I think she just she, I think she, you know, I think she just worked at it, and and she, you know, she 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 had a. I mean, this sounds so glib, but she, she had a great sense of humour. Like she found things funny, um, bleak things made her laugh, and and I think it was just apart from that, it was just iron will. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> she left me the gun. Thank you.